T.J. Hooker returns next week at this time. Now a special presentation. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Happy to welcome Heath, Keith Champagne back to Word Balloon. I, I gave you a soft K, so I felt like I had to start over again. Good to see Heath, you, man. Heath, whatever you want to call me, John. It's all good. I'll call you Han. Hey, Han. You can call me Han. That's our... <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. That's awesome, man. Uh, good to see you. Um, God, I'm happy to uh, talk about your Zest World comic Refresh uh, people's uh, memory about the platform. I feel like among the digital comics, Zest World sometimes doesn't get the love that some of the other digital comics do. Yeah, um, there might be a, a little bit of a, a crossed wire here because I'm not really involved with Zest World. Oh, I, I did. Thought... Uh, no, oh, I, I... I mean, I, I uh, kind of linked up with Zest World a, a, a bit ago. And uh, uploaded the first issue of my Daybreak comic to their to their platform. It's sort of you know they're sort of like a Substack. Oh, excuse you know? me. Okay, man, I'm sorry about that because yeah, I I thought it was uh, still you know, and again, I guess the f the first issue of Zest World is still there. I know we're gonna talk about uh, uh, the most recent issue yeah. or part of that Daybreak. So there she is. All right. Well, yeah, then I mean, I mean, the comic you know, is still available on on Zest World. The first issue is, but it, I've sort of moved on from that platform. Uh, I probably should, should take that stuff down. I'm, I'm on Substack now with my new pain company. Okay, man. Okay, that's uh, and again, I'm sorry, Keith. So give give people, and I'll throw a banner up of uh, the name. You know how what your how your Substack reads. I imagine it's that basic, but tell me yeah, what. I don't uh, really know. I just started it myself on Substack. I put up my first. Uh, my first message the other day, or email, or what do they call it? Some 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 sub yeah. yeah, the newsletter. What's your? What's so your I'm, I'm still, it's just a uh, you know new pain uh, productions uh, uh, substack .com, I think. Oh yeah, your logo, absolutely, man. Your angry uh, your angry face logo, correct for your uh, comments? Yeah. yeah, the screaming angry face. <laughs> and then the, and then daybreak, uh, the fourth issue of daybreak is on uh, Kickstarter a couple of days ago. Congratulations. That's cool. Excellent. There again is uh, a That's good a girl. Uh, yep, absolutely. So remind people what um, what Daybreak uh, is all about. Uh, so Daybreak is basically a, a solar powered hero. And it, it's hard to talk about the series too much without getting into spoiler territories. Hey, Mike. Um, oh, hi, Chem Dog. I think I met Chem Dog. He came to see me at a show. In Massachusetts, I believe that was Kem Dog. Oh, you know, I think last time we talked, I think you made that uh, connection. Absolutely, man. Yeah, he, he popped in. We had talked for like an hour, I think, or, or close to it, <laughs> which was good because it was a slow show. So I had someone to, to bullshit with. 
No, uh, Daybreak is uh, a solar-powered hero. Again, like I said, it's hard to talk about it in depth because a lot of stuff happens in the first issue that sort of uh, sets up the series, but also spoils it for people that haven't read it. But uh, long story short, she finds out that she's dying, uh, which seems impossible because she's immune to everything, basically. Well, and also uh, solar-powered, so you would think there's always an energy supply. Yeah, right. Uh, and so it's sort of, you know, her trying to unravel that mystery of how she has gotten sick. Uh, it has to turn to her arch nemesis, uh, kind of her Lex Luthor character, uh, for help. And they have a very twisted uh, rivalry. Uh, and it sort of uh, goes down dark paths that way. Awesome. Uh, Dennis Hoffman, uh, apparently a fan because he said he hey, just Dennis. backed uh, Daybreak 1 through 4 on Kickstarter. By the way, what's the project you and Neil Edwards have been teasing? Um, we have several projects that we've been sort of dicking around with. Uh, one of them is called Big Time. Uh, first of all, if you don't know Neil, if you don't know Neil Edwards' work, like he's amazing. Like Neil is, uh, uh, I I think like a, a genius of comics that doesn't really get talked about enough. So I feel really lucky that he wants to work with me on stuff. But cool. uh, yeah, no, one of them is called Big Time, which is a superhero book uh, that we're that we're in the process of pitching around right now. And then we have one called Supernova, which is a science fiction uh, project. And then we have a third one. Uh, and these are all Neil's ideas, and he's asking me to come in and help him shape them up and everything. Uh, I called uh, Silverback. Which is uh, okay. It's sort of like a, a bizarro Punisher in a way. Like it's it's a Punisher style vigilante, but with a very different, uh, much darker motivation behind his his actions. And it's all you know beautifully drawn stuff by Neil, who very much um, he worked with Brian Hitch. He was Brian Hitch's kind of understudy for a while. Uh, so he's very much in that school of illustrative art uh, with amazing storytelling. Uh, oh, and then also, uh, Neil and I have a project for Aftershock, which has been in limbo for a year now. Uh, it's called The Death Whisperer, which is uh, they owe us money for. And we're just kind of sitting around. Uh, Neil and Pete Tomasi and I are, are in that one. We're, oh, well, good luck with that. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, I know. They're they're kind of slowly coming out of the bankruptcy coma, but it is slow. And uh, yeah. Oh, it's so slow. Yeah, we just yeah. got a letter yesterday that said they're, they're pushing out like three more months now. So I don't know. No, I understand, man. Uh, you know, yeah, Aftershock was a sponsor for Word Balloon for several years. And, uh, yeah, I mean, believe me, I've, I I, uh, I shared your pain. And um, what can you say? I mean, unfortunately, it happens with some uh, some comic publishers, you know, just like, unfortunately, uh, restaurants with COVID. You're watching a lot of, uh, you know, some of my favorite eateries around Chicago and stuff going down. And it's like, oh, man. And uh, same, same thing sometimes with... Uh, some of these publishers as well. Um, Mike says that uh, New Pain is putting out some great books like CUDA, Microscopic, and uh, of course Daybreak. So, uh, you know, are, th are these all books you're involved with, Keith? Or are you just helping people out putting it on the imprint? Uh, those three. Hi, Mike. First of all, Mike is, is um, a great backer of New Pain. He's, he's there every campaign and helping us out. Uh, every single campaign, Mike's uh, order gets screwed up somehow. Like it's happened every single time there's something missing in his package or there's, you know, the wrong book is sent to him or whatever. And he just rolls with it and we fix the problem. Uh, he's the, the nicest, most patient guy. And I, I've met Mike in person, I believe, uh, when I did a signing in, uh, in Iowa uh, a few years back. So, uh, you know, he's a cool dude in my book. Um, but, yeah, those are all books that, that I've written. Most of the new paint stuff, I've, I've written everything except for one book. Uh, because it's my company and I don't pay myself to do this stuff. I do all these books for free. I don't make, I make sure the artists get paid. Um, but I don't make any money on this stuff. I'm just, I'm really just doing this stuff for the love of comics. And, uh, so yeah, Nakuda is like a, a hard boiled, uh, crime comic in the seventies of New York. And then it has a time jump. Um, microscopic yep. is also, a um, really, it's a comic about self-esteem that takes place in sort of the microverse, our version of the microverse. And then Daybreak is, you know, our 
kind of like our flagship character at this point. Yeah. Your superhero, absolutely, man. Well, you know, um, geez, man, I, I, I think you and I have only seen each other face to face at one or two cons. But yeah, next time I see you and everything, I gotta, uh, I'd really, I'd, I'd love to read Kuda. I'm, a, I'm a big crime comic nerd. So yeah, hello, you know. hello, Jeff. Are you doing terrific con again this year? Oh yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, come on by. We'll have you know, it's crazy. Uh, Fan Expo Chicago is the same weekend, and um, I have to confess, uh, they. A lot of people had to back out last year at Fan Expo, and uh, outside of a couple friends that I'm really glad I saw, and Todd Stashwick, one of the the bad guy captain in uh, Star Trek Picard, and yeah. um, and Frank Miller, who I finally saw face to face for the first time in uh, 17 years. Um, that was that's the reason why I went. And uh, Terrific on the same weekend as Fan Expo Chicago, and this year. Hitch is coming to Chicago. Johns is coming to Chicago. A lot of the Ghost Machine guys that uh, Jeff has under his imprint are coming, among others. Yeah, they're, well, they're doing all the Fan Expo shows. I was talking to Tomasi yes. yesterday, and they're basically on that circuit. Yes. But, um, you know, I, I Mitch is, Mitch Halleck of Terrificon has been incredibly good to me since we established the relationship. And even though uh, Fan Expo is in my backyard the same weekend, I'm like, yeah, I'll be in Mohegan Sun. I'll be in Connecticut, uh, and with a lot of great, uh, you know, talented people like yourself. So I'm not, I'm not that disappointed. I, I talk to Jeff enough. I don't, I, you know, the one guy that I was bummed about was Hitch, because I've really got to know Brian. He's going to be at uh, MegaCon this weekend yeah, in Orlando. They're all, they're all heading down there too. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And uh, and I'm like, oh, Hitch, damn it. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's like it's like Mark Miller comes to Chicago like every, oh, not quite every ten years, but close to it. And it's like, oh, I don't want to miss you, man, when you're in town. And same with Hitch and everything. It'd be the first time I see him beyond doing what we're doing now and stuff, either a Zoom or a Streamyard. So like, oh man. So that's my only regret as far as uh, fan expo. No, I'm happy to be a terrific con, and I will see you there. That's excellent. And hey, that's maybe cool. next year Mitch will book Brian for a show. Uh, I know he's been trying. So believe me, I, you know, and I, and also when I become better acquaintances with creators that maybe Mitch hasn't established a relationship yet with yet, I'm always like, Hey man, you got it. I'm like, and I mean it cause you know, it's a great show. Oh, it's a great show. Yeah. It's such a great, such a great comic book artist show. Like he really brings in, you know, some, some great names every time. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I mean, you know, a lot, a lot of firsts for me, um, I'm not. I'm not a fan of his politics, but I, I got to admit it was amazing uh, getting to do a panel with Starenko after he's been teasing me for many years. But oh yeah, eventually, John, we'll do a talk. We'll do a word balloon, and it's like, well, at least I finally got you to sit down, Jim. Now you can't go anywhere because everyone wants to see you at your panel and stuff. And you need you 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 need an MC for you to to drive. I'm like, I'm happy to do it. So, so that was my thing. And my great regret a couple of years ago, I was sick. And I missed uh, poor George Perez, God bless him, and, uh, and and Marv Wolfman. I've met George many times before, but I was in the hospital during C2E2, the Chicago show. And um, they're like, hey, man, if you're going to be at C2E2, we need a we need an MC for Wolfman and Perez. And I'm like, uh, uh, I'm in the hospital, man. I can't make it. I was so bummed. Uh, what are you going to do? So, oh, this is nice. You see, Mike is a loyal customer, man. He goes, you always do right by me, Keith. Thanks, and yes, we did meet at Limited Edition, great show, in Cedar Falls before uh, COVID. Next time you and the rest of the gang come back, I'll be there for sure. Very nice. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you, buddy. There you go. And uh, our yeah, borough, I, I never I never say his name right, our boroughs. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Dennis also says, uh, love Neil, his work on Herc and Justice League Unlimited were great. Sure. Well, Dennis, you might like Neil's uh, uh, surprise daybreak cover coming up in a couple of weeks too. Outstanding. No one knows about it except for Dennis. Right now, Dennis is the only person I've told. How long is uh, how long is the campaign for uh, daybreak for? Uh, it runs through most of February. I think to the the last day of February, the twenty seventh or twenty eighth. Okay, uh, okay. I keep yeah. forgetting it's a leap year, man. I oh, is it really? Oh, I didn't even know that. Absolutely, twenty nine, and uh, so uh, and of course too uh, because of that. I used to love. I don't know if you used to get the old DC uh, calendars, and back when editorial would like you know claim various dates for various heroes' birthdays and stuff, and Superman's birthday. I know now we celebrated in April because of 
Action One being in April of 38. But it's like, no, it used to be February 29th, which was fantastic. Then now he's an alien, but he's got a leap year birthday and everything. So, Yeah, I always heard he was he was born on February, February 29th. That was always yeah. the thing when I was a yeah. kid. Yeah. And that's how he's still he's so young still. Exactly. That's, right. That is part of the reason. Absolutely, man. That and always, as you know, as a JSA uh, veteran, uh, the uh, sliding scale of the JSA's uh, age. Yeah, so. no, they just, you know, I think Nightwing's uh, older than Batman at this point. Like, there's a sliding scale <laughs> yeah. for all that shit. <laughs> That's true. It's absolutely true. I'm enjoying the three Golden Age books. And I mentioned to you before we started that uh, Tim Sheridan, I just talked to him on Monday, uh, not only for uh, Green Lantern, he's doing the Alan Scott book, but also um, he's one of the writers on uh, Masters of the Universe, uh, Revelations. And that ties in with a project of yours coming up. Yeah, that's my you know my my gig right now. Outside of New Pain, I'm working on the Masters of the Universe Revelations comic for Dark Horse. We have comes a, out a in, first issue in the can. Oh, excellent! It is already in the can. That's good. And it comes out. I want to say in April or. Uh... I believe the first issue is in May. Oh, May. Okay. But I could be wrong. I don't. I don't pay that close of attention to those things anymore. Well, I don't want to push your deadline either, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. Um, who who are you inking over? Uh, a Brazilian artist, Daniel uh, HDR, who I actually worked with uh, coincidentally on Green Lantern a long time ago. We did a couple of issues of uh, some storyline with John Stewart, and then you know just happened to reunite all these years later. He's a, a good artist, good penciler. That's cool. And Tim was telling me that. Um, it's him and uh, the other guys that were in the writer's room. I mean, technically, there's only five episodes of that He-Man show. Kevin Smith wrote the first, last, and the one one of the middle ones, and then Tim wrote the other two. They, he's got the writer's credit on them. But he did tell me that it's um, two other guys that I believe are writing the uh, Netflix com or comic, or rather the Dark Horse comic with you guys. So clarify this for me, because sure. a couple, couple right. of years ago, there was a Kevin Smith uh like he-man cartoon on netflix right that's right so is this the same one because i don't even know no it's a new, it's a second season what they did was for the first season there were 10 episodes they broke it into two sets of five so they spread out after the first five there was a couple months before they released the second five and frankly there was a big flap there were trolls but also even i think non-troll he-man fans we're a little upset because after the first episode, something happens to Prince Adam and he's off screen and suddenly it becomes Tila's story for the next several issues or episodes. I keep doing that with TV and comics issues, yeah, episodes, yeah. No, no matter what I'm talking about. And everyone's like, well, you kind of bait, bait and switched us, Kevin, because you're like, oh, it's a Masters of the Universe thing. We're expecting He-Man to be the lead. And, and Smith had to go online and say, hey, calm down. There's 10 episodes. It's a long story, and thankfully, of course, Adam mid mid uh, run comes back, so you get he, he Man and Tila together again. This new season, and I really am interested in, in this comic that's coming up. I gotta confess, Keith, I am not a He Man guy. I was too old, you know. That was that was late high school, early college. So I was trying to get laid. I'll be <laughs> I'll be crass and be like. Yeah, you know, I got to be honest. Am I going to spend dollars on comics, or and or am I going to watch cartoons, or am I going to try and get the cute girl? I'm going to try and get the cute girl. So, I didn't watch. I've always appreciated that. I my three that it's like, sorry guys, I'm too old. I I missed the boat. Thundercats, Transformers, He Man. Yeah, see, again, that was my that was my after school, like in high school. Uh, I get home, uh, slump down on the couch. And watch Thundercats, Transformers, and He-Man, and GI Joe also was in the, you know, in the mix. So I, I was a big, I was a big He-Man fan when I was a kid. I did watch that Revolution series, or that not Revolution, but the, you know, the one where, where Tila took over a couple of years ago. Well, that was Revolution, and I think this is, oh no, 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 Revelation was the first se season, and now we're in Revolution, or vice versa. I'm not sure. Hello, not my name, by the way. Yeah. Oh, and that's cool. You know all these guys. That's good, man. These are oh, no, I'm, just to, I'm just trying to acknowledge everybody when they pop up. All right. No problem. <laughs> all 
Uh, and that's why I'm just kind of throwing them up, and uh, I want I want uh, at least the video people to know uh, what's going on and who's watching us. Um, yeah, so know, but I'm, with, with this comic that I'm doing for Dark Horse, uh, I was bummed out. I probably shouldn't talk too much about what happens in it because it won't be out for a while. But there was no He-Man on the first issue, and I emailed the editor. I was like, "Dude, where's He-Man?" Interesting, like, just like just like this show. Comic. But it's uh, it's a lot of Skeletor, which is also cool. Sure. And then some some guy, uh, I guess he's like Skeletor's mentor, or like another evil wizard. Like maybe the yes. guy died, like before Skeletor that came along. Yep. And he seems to be a big part of this thing too. No, it's uh, a truly. Um, again, I really don't know beyond the basics as far as the He-Man mythos goes. But I, I, I of course, genuinely appreciate uh, the idea. And I'm glad it's out there, and I'm I'm glad for people like yourself that grew up with it. I think that's great. Smith clearly loves this because I th I, I enjoyed the first season very much. This second season, uh, they don't waste time, man. Uh, first episode, there's there's Prince Adam and E Man at a big action scene, and uh, and really Tila doesn't show up until after the action scene, and then they're together. And it's Melissa Benoist, Supergirl, oh yeah, and yeah. Uh, and her husband Chris Wood is playing He Man. So that's cute too that the two of them that's are together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it, and I, I, think, it was, I think the one we're doing is like a prequel to this cartoon. You're correct. I think it takes Absolutely. place before that. Here's a question for you: If anyone watching this knows the answer, because I don't, but like, have they ever explored like who Grayskull was? Like, he always says like, "By the power of Grayskull, I have the power." Like, who the fuck was Grayskull? Well, and why? And why is the castle called Grayskull? Uh, Grayskull Green is another yeah. thing. Don uh, sure Don Glute. I don't know if you remember Don Glute. Don Glute, great. You know, he much like Larry Hama with G.I. Joe, Don Glute was the guy who Mattel is like, all right, we got these toys. We don't have a story. Give us a backstory. And, you know, of course, the original mini comics and stuff kind of yep. fleshed out the mythos. Um, so, yeah, Don, uh, my friends at uh, the podcast Around Comics had Don on their show. And even came, they used to do their show live from a, uh, a comic shop here in Chicago. And Don came in, and and I I don't remember the explanation. You might have to go to them, or of course, uh, the two gurus of uh, Masters of the Universe, uh, real hard uh, real world history and the and the mythos. Uh, Tim Seeley and his brother Steve. Um, in fact, I don't know if you remember uh, Dynamite. I want to say made a Masters of the Universe art book. And it had all the conceptual art for the toys and great uh, comic book art and also cartoonists that just wanted to do, you know, various uh, car cartoonists would do commission sketch sketches or whatever. And, oh, it's such a great collection of art and the whole story of the toy and the, and the TV show and everything. Um, are you doing any sort of uh, alternate covers for the miniseries? No, I'm oh, just right. kind of kind of the the uh, ink robot. Uh, All right, the interiors. You're not a robot, but yes, I understand. Oh, that's fine. I, I'm happy to be a robot. You know, it's better than digging ditches for a living. I hear you, man. What is you know? I know that everyone, honestly, uh, especially fans, but also people in the biz, uh, are always kind of concerned about the future of inkers, given that there are some artists that will you know use uh, digital tricks to kind of enhance their pencils and kind of sidestep and anchor and stuff, you know, how, how are things going? I, I mean, so far I don't, I haven't been affected by it. I know there are a lot of guys that prefer to ink themselves now. Um, and I think mostly it's a financial thing. Like why not get paid twice for a page as opposed to having to split that rate with, you know, another artist. Sure. So, so guys that are fast enough um, are able to do that. Uh, a lot of these guys that, that I think ink their own stuff, I wouldn't really call them inkers. You know, it's a lot of dead limelight stuff, and they let color do a lot of the heavy lifting for the art to kind of, um, you know, make it more dimensional and, and uh, fleshed out. But more power to them. Luckily, I, you know, I'm as employed as I, as I want to be. You know, Good to hear. And, uh, and, and it's, it's been that way for 30 years now. So I'm sure my yeah. luck is going to run out at some point soon. Well, but that's great in terms of you're cranking out your own books. I yeah, mean, you know, yeah. I, you know, I'm sure you've, you know, do, do you know Andy Parks? Are you friends with Andy? I know, I know of him. I don't think I've met him. Okay, Andy's a good friend. Uh, we, we go way back, 
And certainly, you know, after inking Phil for a while and stuff, he started writing his own stuff. And God, you know, he uh, he he co-wrote the two uh, uh, Chris Hemsworth <laughs> Netflix films, Extraction and Extraction Two. So he's not only having good success with his comics, but he's you know he's writing screenplays now too. Yeah, no, that would be amazing. I definitely have had adventures in Hollywood over the years with different properties, uh, but nothing that's ever given me that that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You know, maybe uh, like a, more like a bag of coins at the end of the rainbow. I, so, did, but so, I that's what, you described my radio career. I quite understand that. <laughs> Believe me, I know. Uh, Kem a couple comments. He goes, I think uh, there's a spirit of Grayskull inside the castle. Okay. Yeah, but who was Grayskull? Right. Like, there's got to be one of those uh, wiki, uh, a He-Man wiki that's online that can tell us about uh, Grayskull. And also, Kem Dog says, Alan Oppenheimer, a great character actor, will always be his Skeletor. Although, Mark Hamill, sure. doing a great job. Mark Hamill's killing it once again. So, uh, Dennis wants to know how you hooked up with uh, Stefan on Daybreak. Uh, so, yeah, the Daybreak artist, his name is uh, Stefan Tasha. He's a Canadian artist. And I first met uh, Stefan. Um, I wrote a book called Silver Streak for uh, Lev Gleason Presents, which is, uh, you know, we, we, we kind of did our up updated, like, new version of Silver Streak. And yeah, I think that, was a, that was a 50s or 40s uh, character for Lev Gleason, sure. Yeah, like yeah. A, a public domain character. And I don't even know if they've put the book out past the first issue. Like, I wrote it. Uh. Like years ago, I have copies of the first issue. I got one right here, actually, in my pile. On my Zooming desk. in. Boom. Wow. So the yeah. So, Stefan, um, after we finished it, you know, uh, we had our one and only talk that we've ever actually, like, spoken to each other. We did, like, a Zoom call. And he was just kind of, like, poking around, like, hey, you know, we should keep working together. Like, maybe we could do something else somewhere. And it took about a year. I had a couple of projects at different companies that I tried to keep him attached to that didn't work out and stuff. And then when I started New Pain, he was the first guy that I contacted. I was like, do you want to, you know, work with me again on this Kickstarter? It's kind of speculative. I don't know what kind of money we're going to make, blah, blah, blah. But he wanted to do it. And uh, he's great. Like, he's so good. You know, for um, he's relatively fast. He can do a page a day of pencils and inks. In color like four pages a day when he when you know he reaches that stage of the game uh his storytelling is amazing you know i just his uh finished art just looks different than anything else out there um but it's just really solid really you know really talented collaborator he's great and i love when he takes my script and just changes it and does what he wants with it and then it makes me sort of uh reject things in the fly to kind of keep up with him it pushes me a little harder you know that's great. No, that's fantastic. Um, you know, it's it's funny that you mentioned, God, I hadn't thought of Silver Streak in a long time. And I'm always intrigued by those uh, characters like Crime Buster and other Lev Gleason uh, creation from uh, from the 40s and 50s. Of course, the Golden Age Daredevil. And, you know, obviously everyone's uh, buzzing about public domain because yeah, of Steve yeah, Willie going in a public domain. And they're now come the, uh, come the years bef uh, from when uh, Superman and Batman are going to hit the public domain as well. Are there, as as someone that is putting out their own comics, are there any other public domain heroes? You don't have to spoil if you've already got something in the works, but any anything intrigues you? Because I think there's a lot of good ideas in there. There are a lot of speedsters. There are a lot of Superman knockoffs and Batman knockoffs and the like, even Arrow characters, you know. Yeah, no, nothing, nothing that's really grabbed me, um, which is to say that there won't be one that I'll stumble across and be like, oh, I have an idea for this version. Uh, for a new version. I know, like, with the, um, you, know, you mentioned the classic Daredevil character and uh, Crime Buster and those guys. Like, I did I did also write a project for Lev Gleason, like a Avenger-style book uh, for a series that takes a lot of those characters and, you know, it's got oh, wow. three, you know, and they're they're fighting out the, the Yellow Claw, which they just call the Claw now. I, yes, of course. It. Yeah, 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 unfortunately. But great design for a bad guy. I mean, yeah, a very yeah, monstrous... Yeah. Uh, the claw is a very monstrous looking character. Is um, so was that for Lev Gleason or was it for his yeah. estate? Yeah. Wow, I didn't, know, was, uh, I didn't know he was. I didn't know he was. Yeah, and, uh, I also don't know what's going on with that one. I know I saw two issues of art for that in black and white. 
Um, actually, with the first issue they released for Free Comic Book Day a couple of years ago, they did like a newsprint edition, and that was. Uh, but I don't know when the actual series is going to come out. I should probably check. And he's still around. I mean, he's got to be incredibly old if uh, if it's really him. Yeah, or is... uh, no, no, Lev Gleason, I don't think is alive anymore. But this company, uh, right, called Lev Gleason Presents. They co-opted his name, or their pro the estate, yeah, or I think something. Through, through his estate, they have sort of their the stamp of approval to do these books. Understood. Understood. Yeah, no, again, that cool. was a big force in the golden age. Absolutely, man. And I, I love. Uh, I know. Um, God, I'm blanking now. Uh, Savage Dragon um, creator. Eric Larson, um, yeah, Eric Larson, yeah, brought uh, the Golden Age Daredevil in as into Dragon and everything, which yeah. was great to see. No, I I am fascinated, and again, I keep saying this. I'm sorry, I'm a broken record for people who have been really paying attention to recent episodes of Word Balloon. I always use the uh, the Tarzan example of technically a lot of those Edgar Rice Burroughs stories are in the public domain, so Dynamite can get away with their Lord of the Jungle titled comic book. But, you know, the name Tarzan, though, has been trademarked forever by the Burroughs estate, just like as uh, the uh, while the opportunity exists for another company to do a Action Comics 1 version of Superman or of, uh, the year following that, a Detective 27 version of Batman, uh, that's going to be a tightrope because there's a lot of things you can't do given what was in detective 27 and action one, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and in fact, um, I just talked to Jurgens and Mike Perkins and they're doing a Batman story set. Like say it's a week after detective 27. And when that public domain period hits, I wonder if their use of the depiction of Bruce and Batman as done in 27, that they can like point to, this year's comic and go ah you know actually uh back in 23 we did this comic and it's it's copywritten so again you better watch what you think you can do and what you can't do and again you certainly can't call them even bad hyphen man or uh you certainly can't title it superman because those things are trademarked yeah no i think you're onto something right there with that with that batman jurgens book like that's maybe a reason why that book exists is just to lock down that copyright of that version of the character again yeah, I mean, I, I genuinely believe Mike and, and Dan because he's, you know, Dan's like, oh, no, I pitched this years ago. And at first, I think they were given that um, Tom King was doing uh, his Gotham City year one. Maybe at first, especially last year, like, yeah, you know, there's too much product out there. But yeah, I, I got to believe some lawyers like, hey, that's a good idea. Yeah, someone opened their eyes and said, hey, we should greenlight this one because, you know, we could lock this down. They'd probably do the same thing for action number one. I was going to say, absolutely. Well, and also, uh, God, and I, I'm sure, I don't know, I don't, I'd, I'd be curious. I never really asked about it. Do you remember the novel, uh, It's Superman by Tom DeHaven? No, I do not. But within, if it wasn't in the 90s or early 2000s, it was pretty damn close. And it was really like kind of a year one Superman story where it really was Daily Star, original Clark Kent. You know, and I mean, Lois, you know, Lois was in it. Lois is in action one. But I know for like this 39 Batman story, it's like, uh, of course, no Robin. Of course, no Alfred. Of course, no. And they don't want to have any of Batman's rogues gallery show up. And I'm like, no, no, no. This is this is Bruce, like just getting started. Jim Gordon is in the book because he's in that first story. Uh, I'm intrigued. And I mean, also, I love I don't know about you, man. Uh, well, of course, and a guy that also has played with various uh, Golden Age designs when you were doing JSA and stuff. I, I just love a lot of uh, the, the original uh, look of both Superman and Batman. I think they're classic, and both, you know, Kane and, um, and Joe Schuster were kind of, you know, I, I like their original stuff. Yeah, no, it's very charming. You know, I, I don't think you can refer to either one of them as, like, sophisticated artists anymore. But I'm sure at the time that was like a bold of lighting with designs like his in the stands back then. I mean, they did cool. something to capture the attention of the public. So, well, Ken, Ken Dog's right. Purple, purple gloved Batman. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no Batmobile. Red, red Roadster. And in fact, Perkins very proudly grabbed a model that he's using to uh, to draw and everything. And it's like, yeah, man, that was the car. I remember I had the Michael Fleischer Encyclopedia of Comics. I had both. 
the Superman volume and the Batman volume. And yeah, you go through the history of the Batmobile and it's like, yeah, it took a while before they called anything the Batmobile. And even at, um, prior to that fantastic one that looks like a Hudson old 40s car with um, the big bad emblem that was almost like a cow catcher on a, on a, rail, a railroad yeah. engine. Yeah. You know, even before that, he had a car that almost looked like a Mercury or like one of your classic 30s cars that had a hood ornament that had a Batman <laughs> on the hood and everything just this little thing so no i i'm again i i'm a sucker for anything golden age like that not my name has an answer for you about grayskull apparently in the 2002 series grayskull was an ancestor of prince adams uh different countries different continuities and all that sure oh, well, i can appreciate that. that no i never appreciate that but he had, had no idea no is it, Dennis, so, so is the he-man power is it sort of like a familial thing does it just pass to Adam's family, like if he has a kid, would that kid be like he boy at some point? <laughs> or why doesn't his father, the king, have yeah. uh, the, Does his power? father have that? I don't know. I think we got a loophole here. This is going to call for like a twelve issue series that really examine like the bloodline of, of uh, Prince Adam. Hey, pitch it, Keith. See, all right, get, get Dark Horse interested in that. Uh, and, and I was going to say, paging, paging Tim Seeley. I have a bad feeling there's an answer, but uh, we don't know it. Uh, Dennis Hoffman also says. Uh, loved your inks on Netho Diaz. Hope I'm saying uh, your your name right, Netho. He brought in. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's I think it's Netto. I went over this earlier today with someone too. Uh, okay, I, I, that's how that's what it was told to me. I've never talked to him and t to the artist Netho in person, just through email. But I like inking him. Um, exhausting, for sure. Uh, he puts every you know every brick on the wall and every uh, you know leaf on a tree. He's not doesn't skimp on the details, so it takes some time to ink his pages. But very dynamic, like very good storytelling, and uh, really on his way up in the industry right now. Like he's a rising star. There you go. Uh, all right, a couple answers regarding the power of Grayskull. Uh, the the power can be shared, like with Cringer. Right. <laughs> Honestly, man, I'm watching I'm watching uh, Revel Revelations this the second season. And it's like, I kind of know who that is. I have no, I, I keep calling Sorceress Enchantress, thinking of the Thor villain. And my good friend Susan Eisenberg is voicing Sorceress for both uh, uh, seasons of uh, Masters. And yeah, it's like, oh yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Don't remember. And uh, Kem, Kem Dog says, uh, King Randor was never He-Man, as far as I know. Well, here's a question for you guys that are watching the show right now. Uh, who could win in a fight? Lionel or He Man? See, once again. In a fight to the death, who wins that fight? Lionel from Thundercats or He Man? Well, you know, well, Lionel, I would imagine, has the feral thing going, being a beast. He's but got that again, sword of omens giving him sight beyond sight. And then He Man's got that big old uh, Gray Skull sword there, right? Doesn't he? Yes, so, of I course. Of course. It'd be a good fight. Um, God, and that reminds me, again, was not an original Thundercats watcher. And my buddy Chuck, who's like 10 years younger than me, he's like, listen, I know you're not normally into Thundercats, but that, that animated series they did a, a couple of years ago that Mike Jelenic did, and Mike's been a great DC animation writer as well. And he and James Tucker did the Batman Brave and Bold series. And I, that's the only time Mike's been on Word Balloon. But um, I, did, I did watch uh, some of those Thundercat episodes from that new series, and I'm like, no, this is good. And again, that's why I'm like kind of the perfect audience for some of these shows because I'm willing to try something. Sure. And whether, whether I know it's past or not. In fact, uh, Blue Eyed Samurai. Have you watched that on Netflix? Oh my God. Blue Eyed Samurai is so good. Right? Franco from Art and Franco and Tiny Titans uh, fame. He's been begging me to watch that. And last week I had uh, Palmiati on before. And just like your response, he's like, John, this is a great show. You've got to watch this show. Like, so right. good. And it's amazing. The, the, the characterization is so deep. You know, it's, it seems yeah. uh, historically so accurate. And it could be faking it. I don't know the difference. But it feels real to me. The animation is beautiful. Um, I don't know. That, that one really blew me away. Uh, for your question about Lionel versus He-Man, uh, Wesley says, um, He-Man, no contest. And Chemdog says he wants to see a Skeletor mummy Ra team up. Yeah, that'd be that'd be cool. 
Those guys would probably fall in love. <laughs> Outstanding. No, man, I, I, it's, and again, obviously, uh, Blue Light Samurai, I'm assuming, is a Japanese product. Uh, if not, it sure no, as hell. It's not, actually, it's not. It's wow. A Canadian, it's a Canadian animation house that did the, you know, the show and written by Michael Green, who's done some shows and some comics. I and did I believe his, his wife, who is Japanese, is uh, his co creator, co writer on the show. Okay. And uh, it kind of pisses me off. Um, like about 10 or 11 years ago, I had a novel called Butterfly Samurai that I had my agent pitching around. And uh, long story short, no one would uh, bite on it because I'm not Asian. And they were like, yeah, we, it's, you know, you can't write a story about a female girl samurai because you're not a female girl Japanese person. Oh, that gets me mad. Um, and so, like, I was a little, when I first heard Blue Eye Samurai, I was like, fuck, that's really close to my title. I'm getting anxious about this. Like, I've had this story in my head for a long time. But Blue Eye Samurai is so good, I don't even care that it obliterates my idea completely forever. Like, it has a lot of the same themes and, you know, kind of the same, sure. very similar uh, central character. But it's so much better than I would have done anyway that I don't even care. Just go watch it. It's great. I, I get it. Um, it That does frustrate me. I, I, I understand the idea of cultural appropriation. <laughs> However... I also bristle when, you know, you get that general stay in your lane uh, kind of comment. And it's like, no, man, writers have imaginations. They should be allowed to write anything. And I'm sorry, I disagree uh, with the perception of, of cult cultural appropriation in that way. It's like, I don't know, it's fiction. If it's a good story, that's great. And also, thankfully, we're a global world. We're getting more exposed to other cultures uh you know um god now i'm blanking again uh house party the the direct reggie reggie hovland and i yeah. first time we talked reggie and i are about the same age and you know the kung fu craze hit in the early 70s and we were watching the the real golden harvest movies and the shaw brothers movies and stuff but you know richard dragon came out of that and um all the great black exploitation uh belt black belt jones and uh, Shaft and you know, well, more more so like other other black plantation kung fu characters, and it's like that wasn't a cultural cultural appropriation. We all thought it was cool, just like the rest of the world kind of caught up with jazz and are like, "Hey, we like jazz, we like rock and roll, we're gonna do our thing." It's like, you know, I'm sorry, I think it swings both ways, and it's like that's that's just global appreciation of a of a genre. No, That's my I, I, I agree. I, I don't get too cranky about it because, you know, I just wore a lot. Everybody was kind of like, uh, I try not to get too cranky about that stuff because a lot of it's not in my control. Um, well, and if, again, I was, if I was to pitch that book again, I think I would just say, well, I identify as a Japanese teenage girl. And I think I can get away with that now in this modern day and age. You can be anything you want to be. <laughs> Watch it, though. I, I know a very... One of my friends, who's a very well-known man in comics, uh, assumed a, uh, oh, a Japanese yeah, persona. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there you go. And again, yeah. I listen, I, I feel like CB got way too much shit for that. And I'm glad that Marvel... Well, again, that's I understand that subject for debate, and I can appreciate that. Hell, Gary Marshall, the brilliant comedy writer of Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, and so many hit shows in the 80s, and all the movies that he made before he passed away... There was a period that he still, when he was breaking into movies, he still wanted to do sitcom writing. And he and his writing partner adopted Japanese, uh, you know, writing pseudonyms. And um, they wrote a lot of Love American Styles. If you watch the old Love American Style show from the 70s, there are these Japanese uh, names on the scripts. And, you know, he goes, really? They're, you know, he goes, they, they just didn't, because... Their agents are like, no, you're writing movies. If you're back then, if you were writing TV as well, it's like slumming or whatever. And it's like, well, but our friends are the producers of these shows, and they're asking them, to, you know, us to write good scripts for them. So we don't mind, and we'll take any money. We don't care. So yeah, there was just this like, who are these two Japanese writers that really seem to understand American comedy? <laughs> well, you know, know? also it was it was a different time then, a different. Uh, That's atmosphere. fair. You're right. No, no, no. And again, 
you got to read the room and, and you don't want to piss off a potential audience. So yeah, it's uh, it, I just think it's a shame. And again, I don't think, I don't think writers should be limited to whatever people constitute their lane to be, but that's me. Let me ask you a question. If Frank Miller was just starting out today, could he, could he do Ronan? That's a very good question. I don't know. Hell, why isn't, why is that like if, if the perception of that possibly not, not flying today, um, how is that different than a guy like Greg Rucka writing so many female lead heroines? And it's like, no, well, I mean, yeah. that's a man, yeah. but Even he's Daybreak, wondering, you know, I'm writing a female character in Daybreak. You're absolutely right with Daybreak, 100%, man. Bring it back to Daybreak, 100%. And oh, shame she? on you, woman of color. What are you doing, Keith? Who the hell do you yeah, think no. you are? I don't know. That's that's the artist. I never even asked her for her to well, be. That's a woman interesting, of color. Keith. Okay, that's your and advantage. I, you really had no ethnicity uh, thought no. when you created Daybreak. No, that was uh, I gave a, a basic idea for for Daybreak and for the the arch villain character Doc Matter, uh, and basically basically they're yin and yang, you know. So she's black, he's white, she's good, he's evil, she's optimistic, he's an asshole. You know, <laughs> uh, they're, they're as opposite as they can be in every way, but they also are tied together and, and need each other in, in the bigger picture. Yeah, no, I hear you, man. It's uh, so that was some, that was some brilliant designing on on Stefan's part, where he just kind of took that and ran with it. Is Stefan a person of color? No, he's a white kid. He's a, well, right. not a kid. He's in, in his thirties. Okay, I don't want to get you in trouble. I, I no. no. <laughs> No, I, that's that's great, and uh, by, by uh, the parallel to that, or the mere opposite of that, um, uh, Chris Priest uh, just you know wrapped up uh, Superman Lost. He, yeah. He's a black gentleman, you know, and I mean, yeah. and and man, I'm really happy for Priest that um, beyond uh, you know him taking and getting stories, did the great job with Black Panther, has written. Many great uh, characters, uh, black characters for Marvel and DC over the years. But fine, it's like, uh, you know, I can write white characters too. And it's like, yeah, of course you can. And my God, I don't know if you read Superman Lost, a great 10 issue series. It was one of the best cosmic Superman stories. And I'm even saying that because also I loved what Philip, Philip Kennedy Johnson did in action with his uh, cosmic Superman <laughs> stories. But it really was this great existential, very different than War World, what, uh, what Philip was doing. But it, it just blew my mind. And it really is like one of the more distinct Superman stories of, of the last 20 years. It really yeah, blew it, me it's, it's very hard not to be a fan of Priest. He's a, a really great talent, a great writer. And he, even cool. when he was writing under his original name, you know, I remember he did The Unknown Soldier back in the 80s. Jim uh, Owsley. Yeah. Yeah, Jim Owsley. And I was that that one really uh, grabbed me when I was a kid. And I did not like war comics at all, but his Unknown Soldier I thought was fantastic. I always loved the design too of the Unknown Soldier yeah, with those yeah. bandages and the idea that he was kind of, you know, uh, a chameleon and would you know have his like Mission Impo the old Mission Impossible show where he'd have masks and pose as various people and stuff. Now I'm a I'm a big sucker for any uh, Unknown Soldier stories. I hear you though. I felt that way too. Although now as an adult. I find myself going back to a lot of uh, DC War comics and Robert Kaniger and um, you know Russ Heath drawing stuff and of course Kubert drawing stuff. Yeah, yeah, I was I was a big fan of a lot of that stuff. You know, oh that's funny. I agree with you, Wesley. Only the internet cares. Uh, I don't know uh, the life stories of most creative people. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. One hundred percent. Do you want to know my life story, by the way? Because I'll tell it to you right now, Wesley, if you are interested. The or the origin of uh, Keith Champagne. Yeah, no one no one needs to know that. Is is Champagne a pseudonym or is that? Uh, no, that's my real name. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, Keith Keith Christian Champagne is my full name. Outstanding. And, uh, at some point, you know, my family migrated from France to Canada, and then worked their way down here into, uh, you know, Connecticut and Rhode Island, Massachusetts area. Are you able to trace uh, any like were were they uh, you know? Uh, champagne makers and stuff as well i mean yeah my my dad made a half-hearted attempt to do that and uh he went, went up to champagne france he took a little uh trip about 15 years before he passed away uh and he was shocked to find out no one gave a shit that his name was champagne 
and that originally our family came from that area of France. Like he was like, what's going on? I thought I'd be like a king over here, but uh, no one cared. And my dad went home uh, dejected. <laughs> I think he thought he was going to get those royalties or something for all that. Sure. Yeah, we got it. Yeah. Yeah, come come down to the wine cellar. We got we got a we got a few <laughs> bottles waiting for you and everything. Outstanding. That's great, man. Too goddamn funny. Well, I was telling you off the air uh, about uh, my frustrations with uh, Star Trek. I even got into it with a guy on Facebook because they wrote a uh, uh, they've been writing articles about the Michelle Yeoh Section Thirty One movie. Listen, Michelle Yeoh is an amazing actor. I mean, going back to Crouching Tiger, I've been a long time. Oh fan. yeah, yeah, for sure. She's great. She's great. I am not a fan of, uh, I mean, I was okay with Captain Giorgio, uh, who we only saw for the first two or three episodes of Star Trek Discovery, and then she gets killed off. But, uh, you know, you know your Star Trek, you know, the mirror universe and everything. It's like Empress Giorgio, because she was in charge of uh, the mirror universe galaxy or what, whatever empire the mirror universe was involved with. Um she ate, uh, you know, Doug Jones' character, Saru, his species. She would eat that, and they were sentient aliens. So she's kind of a sci-fi cannibal when you think about it. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry. I, it's the truth. And, I mean, and it's like, well, no, she's an anti-hero, and she's going to be the star of this Section 31 thing. Now, listen, I haven't seen a thing. I could be wrong. Maybe uh, we'll be watching a villain-led story. That's possible. But um, I'm like, no, she's not a hero. And he and well, this is a redemption story to make her. And I'm like, uh, once you eat a sentient being, <laughs> I, I think you've crossed the line. That's where I'm like, and especially I don't, and I and I'm such a Star Trek nerd, and I want your opinion on this. But I'm like, I don't see Starfleet going like, oh yeah, let's get the cannibal to help us. That'll be good. Good idea. I think they're probably going to brush that cannibal aspect under the rug a bit maybe sort of uh, ignore that. Uh, I, I think I would suspect it's going to be a redemption story. I'm you sure know, you're right. She, she's not, you know, Giorgio is not uh, as hardcore of a villain as when she first came out of the mirror universe. Like they've already softened her quite a bit. And you're starting to see that, you know, some human, humanity in that character. So I'm sure I, they're going to continue down on that road. But hopefully that, that show, and I'm not a big Discovery fan. I think that's one of the weaker of the Trek shows that I watched. Um, but hopefully Section 31 just has some, some cool stuff to it. But, you know, to me, what was always made, what always made Section 31 interesting was it was just Sloan on Deep Space Nine. That's all we saw. And then we in the Enterprise series, they had a predecessor that was from Section 31. But it was completely mysterious. And, again, another fault of discovery, I think, is the way they've handled Section 31, where they literally had black badges and they had a they had a – it wasn't a secret base, but they had that big base in the second season and stuff. And it's just like, no, no, you're doing it wrong, man. It's like, because uh, I, I and, and I understand what you're saying, too, because they had the um, where where they sent where the Guardian of Forever sent her back to the mirror universe. And it's just like, I understand that you're right. They are kind of trying to, like, redeem her in some way. I'm sorry, yeah, man. Like I said, you already crossed the line with me, and I'm like, and and again, the, they may not, it's it's kind of like ignoring uh, Spider Man and Mary Jane's uh, male son from the Clone Saga years and stuff. And it's like, you can kind of get away with that in comics because that was so many issues ago. There haven't been that many episodes of Discovery, even though they're going on their fifth season. And yeah, I just I think that show banged its head against the wall and ceiling from day one, introducing Michael Burnham as Spock's sister. And it's like, shut up. No, no. It, yeah, I just like to point out, Jean-Luc Picard did not need to be Jim Kirk's grandson to be an interesting character. And, and that goes for all of these subsequent Star Trek shows of the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. It's like, no, man, these characters stood on their own. Yeah, Discovery to me, you know, look... Some people probably love it and good for them. Uh, I don't. It feels to me like a show that was very much created and written by a committee where they're trying to check these different boxes and, and appeal to, you know, well, we got to tie it in to the hardcore track people. So let's make her Spock's sister, even though Spock has never had a half sister, you know, for the past 60 years or whatever it's been, you know, I don't know. 
<laughs> but if, if people love discovery, uh, good for you. I love next generation and some people don't love that. You know, I love the original enterprise. Um, I like this, uh, which the one with Pike now, it's great. Stretch your worlds. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. They're taking some like, big swings in that show. I liked the first season of that. What I didn't like were all the gimmick episodes we got in the second season and not just the musical. I personally felt when the aliens rewired Spock uh, into being more human, I'm like, that was a bad I Dream a Genie or Bewitched episode, especially <laughs> his prospective in-laws being over for dinner and just all the craziness that's happening, and they're they're oblivious to it. And it's just like, man, you only have 10 episodes. It's one thing when we're back in the day when we'd have 26 episodes a season and you can get away with a wacky piece of the action in the original series or um i mean i like big goodbye from the first season of next gen i think that's a great up and, and the yeah, idea yeah. of dixon hill i think is fun but again it was one of 26 and i'm like you got such limited real estate only having 10 episodes and i could point to several goofy episodes also i don't know about you man and again i always say this i ne in including michelle yo as giorgio it's not the actor's fault it's the writer's fault. Paul Wesley as Jim Kirk is one of the worst casting decisions ever. He's so, and he's just wrong. He's just wrong. And it, and I feel like their animosity towards William Shatner bleeds into the way that they portray, or at least the choosing of this actor, because he is so bland. And I always feel like, and again, I want your, I forgive the editorial, but I want to hear what you think too. Um, Jim Kirk like was probably impressive as a cadet and not in the way the Chris and I like Chris Pine and I think Chris Pine does a better job with Kirk, but, and you don't need a Shatner imitation, but like Jim Kirk to me is like young Abe Lincoln. Like he walks through the door and even as a cadet, all the superior officers are like, we got to watch that guy. That guy's going places. Sure. And Paul yeah. Kirk, it's command and charisma. That's Jim Kirk. And I'm not getting those vibes from Paul Wesley. But definitely not the charisma. And I think, um, <laughs> but with the Kirk on uh, Strange New Worlds, you know, their their whole someone told me this or I read this somewhere, I forget with he's not the Kirk that we know uh in the original Star Trek. He's becoming that Kirk. He's growing up to be that Kirk. But I would think, like you said, even as a younger Kirk, he would still have those seeds of greatness. He would still have that spark of charisma, that, that kind of swagger, you yes. know, and so, yeah, I feel like they missed the boat with that. But I do like Strange New Worlds. I feel like that show takes some big swings. They, they, I like the musical episode. I like the, I didn't know Lower Decks until that episode, but I enjoyed that episode. You know, they're, they're trying different things creatively, which I think is great. You're not going to hit the bullseye every time, but, you know, better to try than not to try. Well, and I actually liked the uh, crossover with Lower Decks. Yeah, that was smart. a gimmick episode that worked for me. The musical to me was very gratuitous. And, you know, I know, I, listen, Buffy did it, but again, Buffy did it when you get 20 episodes a season. Waited until the sixth season to do it. Um, the way that streaming shows work, where you might only get three seasons, this next season might be it for Strange New Worlds, especially where Paramount is financially and everything, too. Sure. Um, but I also think, much like their misfires with Kirk, I think Ethan Peck is a better Spock than. Uh, Zachary Quinto was in the Kelvin movies, but that said, I I, I don't buy that uh, young Spock on uh, Pike's Enterprise is going to be as green with interacting with humans because he was at the Academy. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and that's the thing, and and the same with Kirk too, where it's like, I I get that they're younger versions of of the original series uh, versions, but. I, I just think that more of their personality would have taken over at this stage of their ages. And I hate the way they play Spock. Spock is like a freshman moving to a different state and starting high school. And like it, it I find it annoying that all the humans are like, Oh, that's Spock. We just got to teach him how to be human or uh Mabenga, who I love. I love, I love Dr. Mabenga on the show. I think that's fantastic, but he's the guy that gives Spock uh, the, the Vulcan Lyra, the harp. And everything, it's like, what? No, no, I don't think. Good Lord, there's your cultural appropriation there. Yeah, right. We're circling back to that for sure. 
but at the you know my only comment about Ethan Peck is uh, he's got the voice down, man. He, and and the and he really when he when he's allowed to have the poker face, I think yeah. he, he does it better. Quinto, um, unfortunately, and and again, you, it's kind of explained in the story when he loses his mother and Vulcan at such an early age, and Nimoy Spock, his Spock Prime, tells Chris Pine, "Jim, I just lost my planet and my and my mother. Believe me, I'm emotionally compromised." But now uh, the Kelvin universe, Spock McCoy wins because McCoy's got his number, and it's like, see, I knew you had emotions, man. And I and the yeah, you, you 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 claim this poker face, and also when Quito just physically tries to be Spock, it comes off more arrogant than Nimoy's kind of just you know poker face blank. This is who I am. Sorry, and and those moments in the original series when Spock will show his emotions, they're significant. They're they're rare exceptions and everything, and that was only three seasons, but um. Yeah, again, I just think making uh, Ethan Peck the uh, lovelorn, you know, pining for Nurse Chapel idiot character that they've made him. I'm like, man, you guys did a number on Spock and a number on Kirk. And those are the foundation characters. It's like, what are you doing, man? I don't know. I mean, I kind of pine for Nurse Chapel, too, though, if I'm going to be straight about it. No uh, Jess, Jess, Jess Bush is a lovely woman, yeah. and uh, and it is not hard watching her. And, I, and also, truly... They gave her a lot more to do, and they've really redeemed Chapel's character. There also are too many people that are from the original series characters, and I had never heard the words. And I don't know, as as a writer and a comic book guy, if you ever heard this, but regarding uh, prequels, plot armor, and it's like the the cliffhanger they left us with in season two. It's like, well, you know, Scotty's going to be fine. You know, Uhura's going to be fine. You know, Chris Pike and Number One are going to be fine. And it's like okay, like literally, seventy percent of your of your regular cast are going to suffer. Like no, anywhere, yeah, yeah, they're not going to suffer any major consequences from this that that we can see. I I just it's like you and I, listen. I love Scotty and I love Simon Pegg as Scotty as well. Pretty much anybody being Scotty, he's a, he's just a fun character and always has been. When he showed up on Next Gen, when Jimmy Doohan did it, it was like oh, that's so great, man. Because he's just he's fun. He's the best part, I think, of uh, of the fifth movie of Final Frontier, when oh, he breaks sure. the when he breaks the three of them out of the cell, and he's like, "Don't you know a jailbreak when you see one?" And it just <laughs> <laughs> just stuff like that. He's awesome, man. But yeah, I'm like, and again, I'm 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 happy to see him. I guess a little on Strange New Worlds, but also I'm like unnecessary, complete, and especially let's have more Carol Kane, and even going back to the first season, the Andorian or the uh, a near uh, hammer. It's like you had two great chief engineers. What do you? You don't need Scotty. Yeah, I liked Hammer. I thought he died pretty quick on that show. Uh, but Carol Kane's character also is very cool. Like very a lot of history. Yeah. Seems like it has a little, you know a long, almost like almost like Whoopi Goldberg's character in Next Gen that sort of like long lived, has seen it all, but isn't saying what she knows kind of character. I'm really hoping a good friend of mine who's a playwright in New York is good friends with Carol. And she's like, oh, no, I, you know, she goes, it's just a matter of, like, getting her when she's not constantly working and she's out there doing season three of Strange New Worlds right now. And I'm like, well, whenever. I'm like, I'm a patient man. I've had I've had the pleasure of um, having uh, Frakes on the show. And uh, unfortunately, the, the actor's strike last year kind of put the kibosh on the panels I would have done with everybody that was at Terrificon last year. Uh, but I, I know that uh, Mitch has a new crop of – other Star Trek actors that are coming this year. So I'll, I'll, I'll get it then. Did you get a chance to, uh, did you go over and meet any of the uh, people on Autograph Row? I didn't, didn't get much of a chance uh, last year. I have met Freaks before. He's a nice guy. Great guy. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I mean, I, he wouldn't know me from a hole in the wall now, but I had a couple of nice minutes with him where he was super cool. The guy that blew my mind at, uh, at the con last year was Jerry O'Connell. And, you know, he was there because Rebecca was there. Rebecca remained. Yeah. Yeah, and the intent was to have uh, a first officer's panel with Frakes, Rebecca, and Jerry being the first officer on Lower Decks. And uh, so obviously they couldn't do the panel. But uh, Jerry, for not having a table, man, he worked Rebecca's line and made sure everybody that was in line got to meet him. And me and my buddy Chuck were sitting in the green room because he's sometimes my assistant at conventions. 
And Jerry just walks up. And he's like, how you doing? My name's Jerry. Uh, I saw you in line earlier for Rebecca and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I know who you are. I'm like, you know, I'm like, Jesus, with sliders. My Even my secret identity, that terrible uh, Saturday uh, syndicated Canadian show that you did when after Stand By Me and stuff. I'm like, yeah, man. And I'm like, God, what a, what an incredibly charming man to make sure that all the Trek fans got to meet him and shake hands and you want to take a picture? I would love to take a picture. That's fantastic. Yeah, he was great. He's really That's great. That's cool. That's really yeah. cool. Good stuff. Well, thank you for tolerating my my trek. Oh, no though. problem, dude. My yeah, trek rant. Trek all day. <laughs> you got a lot of trek opinions. You're very passionate yeah. about your trek. I, I well, you know, uh, Keith. It was my babysitter when I was a little kid. I've been watching it for literally over fifty years. I mean, I yeah, yeah. I I was that. I I have vague memories of a very small kid on Friday nights when the original series was still in its first run on NBC, and my parents were watching Star Trek. So, uh, you know, I, and, I, and I'm definitely that first generation of syndicated fans from the early 70s that got it and stuff. So, yeah, I can't. I mean, it's uh, I'm like grandma. These are my stories. Don't don't fuck with my stories. man. You <laughs> like know, I can't help. it's like my mom with Days of Our Life. It's like her <laughs> show for her entire life. <laughs> so and hey, man, uh, Days of Our Lives, of course, the great Deidre Hall, uh, yeah. who has we know, is also a lecture woman, a fine superhero. Yeah. I'm a big Deidre fan. Hall. Yeah, oh, man, she's, uh, she's been around a long time now, too. Yeah, Marlena <laughs> was, how many times has Marlena been sent by the devil on Days of Our Lives now? Like, you know, six times? I don't even know. <laughs> it's it's true. Man, uh, quite the uh, quite the pinup model in the 60s. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, no, she was a hottie. She's a massive hottie. And for a, for a very long time, absolutely, man. Hilarious. All right, let me see this final comment if somebody's got something. Uh, there we go. Chem Dog Yes likes hands in the hourglass. <laughs> Come on, that's one of the best opens of any TV show. And, and that's that a great opening. And that Absolutely. music kind of kind of swoops in that da 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 da. I watched a Come lot on. of Days of Our Lives with my mom when I was a kid and through my college years. We watched uh, a lot of days. See, and I was an ABC soap person. My mom was one life to live, massive yeah. fan. And I and I in high school I got into all my children in college and watched all that, and uh, yeah. So those are the and General Hospital, of course. Got uh, Frakes' wife, uh, Jeannie Francis, yeah, Laura yeah. from uh, from General Hospital. General Hospital, and that was great. When I interviewed him, I'm like, hey man. And again, in today's world, I'm like, forgive me if this sounds creepy. I said, but I got to tell you, I've always had a mad crush on on Jeannie, and he was great about. It. He's like. Oh, that's great. He goes, you know, she's in the other room. I'll tell her when we're done. She loves hearing shit like that. And I'm like, <laughs> so, and then she was, and she was at the show. So I'm like, you know, again, you don't want to be an asshole. And you know what? I'm like, hi, Jeannie. How are you? I, I've, I've loved your work since high school. Oh, thank you very much. I'm like, all right, great. Cool. Too fun. And uh, I know um, Scorpio, the guy, the actor who Tristan Rogers, I think I want to say his name is, but he played um, the Australian uh, secret agent. Robert Scorpio on, on General Hospital. I always love. I always love when the uh, when the soaps get into crime or espionage oh, or yeah, crazy oh, yeah, shit. Sure. Uh, John Colicos, core from Star Trek. He was a major General Hospital villain. His name was Mikos Cassidyne, and he had a and it was like a James Bond thing. He had a, a machine that controlled the weather, and uh, and uh, Elizabeth Taylor played in a very brief like week long cameo played his wife, the Contessa. And so, you know, they gave, they gave Elizabeth Taylor for a wife. But I remember that was a big thing where Luke and uh, Scorpio went after Mikos Cass Cassidyne, as uh, Scorpio would say in his Australian accent. Very funny. Great that shit. Actor. Actor. I, think, I, think, I think the first time I saw John Delancey was uh, Days of Our Lives back in the like, late 80s. Oh, yeah. You know? Very proud of that run. Absolutely. Dude, I'm telling you, the soaps were great that way. And, and it's I'm glad the the few that are still out there exist, because uh, man, it's uh, that was a staple of radio even before television. Guiding Light and shows like that were original radio shows before they were TV shows. Yeah, so, yeah. crazy, crazy, dude. Great talk. I love this. Uh, you'll you'll. I hope you appreciated the tangents. But of course, we are here to uh, mention that uh, Keith has a, a Kickstarter going for Daybreak, of which you can if you've missed the first couple issues. You can get one through four as well, but it's issue. It's it's primarily to fund uh, issue four. Yeah, issue four is it's our double sized conclusion. So you know, it's probably going to be fifty six pages if we get the backup story that we've already done in there. 
Uh, the campaign has been live for two days. We're only 500 bucks away from the funding goal. So I think we're, yeah, I think we're in good shape. Hopefully we can crash through that and add some more cool stuff to the book. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm biased because uh, I really love the character. I love making this book, but I've never had one person that has backed it or bought it at a convention for me, come back and say, you know what, hey, your book sucks. Like everyone has loved Daybreak that has read Daybreak. So if people want to check it out, I feel pretty confident that you're probably going to like it. I mean, maybe it's going to be your Star Trek discovery, you know, compared to my my next generation, but let's hope not, right? <laughs> no, I understand. Go to Kickstarter uh, or even a Google search for Kickstarter and uh, uh, for Daybreak and uh, Keith Champagne, and uh, it should lead you to the URL, unless there's a simpler URL, uh, Keith. Yeah, bit.ly backslash Daybreak 4 the number four, not, not spelled out. So that's All a right. short link, or you can just search it on Kickstarter or just email me or something and I'll send you a link. Or find you on social media. You're all, you're all over the place, obviously. I'm all over the place. I'm so tired of myself. Uh, but you got to keep pimping these things. So I understand. Uh, that's great. Um, hey, listen, thanks for talking as always. Uh, yeah, come back. Thing. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. And looking forward to your inks on uh, He-Man on Masters of the Universe for uh, Dark Horse in May. That'll be great. Well, if you don't like the art, it's my fault because Daniel's great. So I, I have fucked it up in my end. I, I, I have full confidence. Full, full blame over that happens. No, no, I have I have full confidence in uh, in what you do, and I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. Uh, where the hell's my closing video? There it is. Thanks a lot, everybody. Tomorrow night, I'm uh, stepping back and uh, talking about my uh, sports radio days with my good friend Dan McNeil, uh, who's really instrumental in getting me in Chicago radio. I was... Prior to that, I was uh, downstate, central Illinois, uh, while I was in college doing radio. Um, never thought I'd get into sports. Ended up spending uh, 16 years doing sports radio total. And uh, Dan was a big reason for that. And we're just going to talk. I don't know how it is in other parts of the country. Keith, where are you based again? I'm Connecticut. Okay, yeah. And, and you know, Mitch usually tells me about Connecticut radio and stuff and, you know, Hartford radio. But uh, – all I can tell you is Chicago being the number three market, local radio really is not what it was when we were growing up and certainly when we were doing talk sports talk radio in the 90s. And it's uh, it's disappointing. And we talk, we'll talk about that. And, uh, you know, Dan's a big movie and TV fan too, so we'll have some fun stuff to talk about. And we're kind of counting on some of our own uh, listeners of uh, the score in Chicago, the sports radio station. That is still going strong, but its uh, character has changed from our days. And, uh, yeah, we're hoping to attract those people. So that's uh, tomorrow night. I want to say it's going to be at uh, at uh, 7 Central, uh, 8 Eastern. So I hope people will join us for that. Until then, everybody stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. <laughs>